then all this news uh, last night, you saw that you had shared that Cole Beasley had liked that tweet about him uh, being on a plane coming to Buffalo. And then this morning, everything really happened fast before the eight o'clock hour. We got confirmation that he was at the Bills and then Garofolo putting it out. Uh, expected to sign to the practice squad and looks like that is done, right? Yep, looks like that's done. Thought it was interesting we're tracking it most of the night. Um, you know, I did reach out to the individual who sat next to Beasley, I was kind of chatting with him for the for the evening and um you know, he made it seem like it was a done deal. He was, you know, used the words watching film or a playbook. Um so, you know. It was good to see that that came to fruition, and um, and I think Josh Josh Allen gets <laughs> what Josh Allen wants, right? Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, there had been kind of rumblings of this, right? Isaiah McKenzie puts out a little bit of a cryptic tweet. Of, what was that about a week ago? Just like uh, tagging Beasley in a post, and then when people were like, "Oh, do you want him here?" He's like, "Oh, just saying what's up to my friend," which I don't know about you, but like. When I say what's up to the, my guys, I just DM them. I don't <laughs> post publicly, so it felt more cryptic. Yeah. In more of a solicitation, like we want to get the band back together, right? It was right after the John Brown stuff. Um, and so I do. we also had heard some rumblings of potential interest in getting him back. And so for it to kind of track all the way to it coming full circle here, and it's a really interesting time that he's coming back here too, Kevin, because I put out a tweet last night. I don't know if you saw it just as a reference point of where the bills were at week 14, a year ago, coming off that uh, Tampa Bay loss where they finally started to click in that second half. But I really think they also started to get Cole Beasley back while the run game got talked about a lot. And the offensive line starting to mesh at that point in time started to get talked a lot. I think this is where Cole Beasley started to, get more healthy from that rib injury, right? He had like, there was like a four to five week stretch where he just wasn't himself. He saw it on film. You saw him laboring. I think this is the point in the season where they got him back to somewhat serviceable. It's interesting. If he could be that serviceable guy that he was at the end of the season, that's a benefit, right? Yeah. I think it was you that just tweeted me, I think um, about can, can he be utilized properly? Uh, Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's, that's the question that is in my mind right now. Can he be used, utilized properly by Dorsey? And I'm still a little bit, not, not overly interested, but still a little bit interested about the Tampa Bay situation. Did he not feel the team was utilizing him? Did he not feel they had a you know real path to, the, to, to anything serious? I'm still interested in to know like what happened there that made him want to retire. That's, that's an interesting topic. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how that played out because we didn't really get to – see much and obviously now in hindsight like too looking at Tampa Bay and like I think even though Brady is able to put up numbers and still like pull out some of those impressive performances we've seen like there's clearly a drop off in Tampa Bay's offense and their ability to put together games and so maybe there's some stuff going on behind the scenes that we don't know there like it's hard to speculate what happened in Tampa Bay yeah I think you'll probably be asked about it I would assume I would yeah yeah, I would guess maybe not um, I mean, you'd hope so. I, I don't know. I mean, Cole Beasley's one of the more forthcoming uh, people. Like, he doesn't hold back his thoughts. But I don't know that he would, like, come out and say anything too salacious about what was going on in Tampa. If there was, like, any real story to sort of behind the scenes. Or maybe he just didn't feel like it was a fit when he, yeah. he got there. Yeah, quite possibly. But, yeah, you know, to, to the Bills' point, yeah, I'm very interested to see – you know, it's expected he's ramped up and ready to go. Maybe that alludes to a little bit of the playbook film slash on the plane, um, ready to play by all accounts Saturday to, to maybe see immediate slot snaps. Um, so yeah, that's... we had seen, I, we, I think he tweeted out not super long ago about getting back into working out. Like he had taken some time off, you know, from football and getting back into it. I think it was before obviously signing with Tampa Bay. And so I'm assuming that he's maintained that this whole yeah. time. How some of this works, you know, Kevin, too. Like, you know, people were talking about the OBJ thing, and obviously that's clearly puts a rest here this season. Um, I can't see a scenario now. Obviously, Beasley's not getting a lot as a practice bag. I don't know what the deal's going to end up being, but it's not going to break the bank. But just in terms of numbers now, there's a bit of a logjam of older veteran wide receivers now in this team. And so you sort of put those things to rest, but – 
what we do know is like behind the scenes, agents have tape of workout. Like they, they'll put these guys through that stuff and send it to teams before this process even gets started. I think a lot of people think they just hop on a plane and then come work out for the team. They do that too, but Beasley's probably been indicating to any of the teams that are interested, it's clearly the Bills, and having those open lines of communication prior to getting on a plane. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what I've definitely been told um, by players and back when I had the Shaq Lawson stuff by Shaq himself, that the player um, the player has to actually be in game shape first, like you're saying. So yeah. ba- Beasley may have been working out knowing that there's an opportunity in two, three, four weeks to re-sign the Buffalo. So it's been something – it's not just something Brandon Bean picks up the phone three days ago and says, hey, you want to play? Yeah, Beasley's on uh, – yeah. Beasley's on the couch chilling right. like that's not how this uh, situation goes and we saw with John Brown like John Brown's getting involved in this you know not into the way some fans wanted him to but he got that big target uh, last week that was almost a game breaking thing uh, for him so he's already being ramped into this offense I'm not sure if we see Beasley ramp in Saturday maybe uh, he's ready to go like that but I do think that it's it's something over the next couple of weeks here we'll really know what the plan for bringing him in is. And I, I think I keep going back to my tweet is there's been frustration really since Dable when thing pieces are brought into this offense and how they're used. Like fans don't seem to have the patience to allow these types of things to play out. Do you think we're going to see that with Beasley? Yeah, I think we should. Um, I think the expectation is going to be he can come in and be a seven catch guy. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, this Saturday, uh, that's a little uh, aggressive. Uh, right. But I definitely think there's, there's packages in third down situations that easily can be utilizing right away. And yep. I, and I also see you, like you mentioned, I mean, Brown did beat sauce Gardner. <laughs> like he did, he still, he still could play. Um, mm-hmm. Um, but still only saw three snaps and he's a couple yeah. weeks in now. So yeah. something to keep in but mind. They're, that... still str- they're finding ways to get Hines involved and that has taken, I mean, granted weird period of time in the season with how that last month played out in terms of ability to get practice time in, but that's taken about a month really for him to fully ramp into the role that they've carved out for him. But I think, like, there's this weird vibe in the Mafia right now of they're 10 and 3, first place in the AFC. Obviously, a very difficult game coming up on the schedule. And then you have the Bengals game, which is tough. But there's this, like, almost desperate need for it to all be clicking at this very moment, which is sort of why I put out. Um, oh, can you still hear me, Kev? Yeah, I guess I'll get you. Um, all right, cool. But no, you're right. Yeah. Like, like it is what's also interesting about the entire scenario here is, um, you know, look at, you've already mentioned seven and six this time last year. We're, we're, we're forgetting about some, some laws, not even the Tampa Bay game, which was, which was a good game. Um, oh, that indie game was terrible. Yeah, indie game was terrible. I mean, obviously we've all talked about Jacksonville enough in all of our shows. Jacksonville. Yeah. Oh um, my God. You know, there was just stretches in there. I mean, and, and we're not, let's talk about the ugly wins last year too. I mean, you had the Atlanta game, which was a sleeting, weird game. Oh, yeah, I was there. That was terrible. Um, so, I mean, even the Jets game to, to clinch the division, like, yes, they won. It wasn't super pretty. Um, yeah. So we all remember the two playoff games, as we should. Uh, but we don't quite always focus on weeks 8 through 12. I mean, November seems to be a little bit of a lull um, at times. Every season. Yeah, it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to say, like, the, the one the one topic I've hated this week is how, like, the team isn't ready. They're not there. They're not Super Bowl ready. Like, some guy broke down how everybody's worse this year. Um, oh, Jesus. Um, what is that? It's, yeah, with the Jerry – I don't want to get into all of the Jerry stuff right now today but like one of my big beefs with this conversation that i've had offline with other friends of mine in regards to originally what jerry asked josh is like who defines what is super bowl caliber right like i have issues with the offense but they're also a top offense in the nfl like there's some nuance in this conversation of being able to say okay i see some struggles and things that are concerning but they're a 10 and 3 team that by almost every indication even um, the type of data that has context to it, they're still a top five team. Maybe. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's completely right. And that's what I use, utilize all the time. And it's, you know, analytics, even if I don't think, even if Kevin doesn't think the offense is top one or top two, 
um, analytics do sure. in some ways. There's a lot of analytics that point to right. many scenarios that they're at least top six in in most categories. Um, right. I mean, including some rushing stats. So what's challenging is, you know, you'll still, you still have fans that are so emotional, um, you know, and will get mad at you and say, call you a homer. But it's like, no, I'm just using this the data. If the data tells me the offense is 28th, I'm going to say the offense is bottom of the league. Uh, yeah. Um, Dude, the offensive conversation has been tough on your boy here because – Honestly, you can ask some people that uh, follow me pretty regularly. In the last, like, two days, I got I made a tweet that said the offense during the game that, like, Ken Dorsey's offense is basic. And I got called a mix of a homer and a hater almost evenly throughout that tweet. When it was in the game, like, I didn't have nuance to the take. But, like, I don't think – I think it's fair to look at this offense and see some foundational issues, even though they're having success. That success is Josh Allen's yeah. running. Right, like this offense is so dependent on him. I think it's a kudos to Josh and a negative against Dorsey. Yeah. Here, Joe. Joe's coming in. Perfect. Yeah, Joe. Uh, thanks for thanks for I, popping up. I didn't recognize that. Yeah, I didn't recognize you without the uh, you in the profile picture, Joe. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Good morning. Yeah, it's uh, honestly, I I go through this like spurt where I just feel like changing my profile picture every five minutes, and just went with the Dexter's <laughs> Lab one this time. Uh, I do. I dig it. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Great. Beautiful. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in um, about the offense specifically. One thing I want to point out, too, is, uh, you know, a lot of people were really worried about how they performed, especially against the Jets. Uh, we never performed, except for one game last season in Outlife. Since Allen's been here, we've never truly, and I mean, like, truly, you know, had a great offensive performance against the Jets. We've had, you know, success on certain drives, certain plays, but for the most part, they always give us a good game. And also, you know, we're, we're looking at a completely different scenario, at least I think so, if four drops don't happen in that game on layup passes. And, you know, a couple by McKenzie, one by Singletary, I think one by Knox. Like, drops are a big issue, too. And that's not a Dorsey problem. That's not an Allen problem because those passes, in my opinion, weren't terrible passes. That's just an execution issue. And when we say that word, like I think a lot about last year because that was something I heard very often with Dable's offense was execution. You know, sometimes those plays are there. People were breaking down the film wondering, is it Brian Dable or is it just we're not getting it done? And you would see open people. You would see passes that were errant. You'd see drops. And I think it's more of the same this year. But the good thing about it is that's correctable. And they corrected it last year. Joe, you watch – you're a film guy, right? Like you watch some of that? I try to. uh, Not as much as you guys. Yeah. I do think, and I don't either, I don't get to watch as much, but obviously I hang out with a bunch of dudes that do and are talking about it all the time, right? And, like, one of the concerning things to me, Eric was pointing out in our DM group, was the Jets players calling out plays, knowing they're coming. There's a predictability to this Bills offense right now. And when you watch comparing around the league and what other offenses are able to do to get their guys in space, to me this feels back to the pre-Dayball days where – I looked at other offenses and felt envious of what they were doing with their tools. And I do think that this offense is still productive. And I agree with you that there is more meat on the bone that's execution based. And like that is good enough to win a lot of games. And I do think that they're still super Bowl caliber, but I, I see what other teams are doing uh, specifically like the Philadelphia Eagles uh, and, and how they're able to move the ball up and down and score with consistency. And that's frustrating knowing the potential of this offense. But I'm also patient and know there's like a month of football left before we get to the real defense. Yeah, let's not forget how good they were in the playoffs. That's the, what everybody likes to point to is that's when you're trying to peak. You're not trying to peak, you know, yeah. in December, uh, early December. No, you want it to start. Yeah, it's starting right now where they already are, right? Absolutely. And I think the thing that you're right, Dorsey did reference yesterday in his press conference himself execution I, I thought it was a little bit of a interesting answer that he was blaming not himself not play calling not he was blaming everyone else he was kind of saying it was an execution issue um that he called the right plays and you know didn't say people were dropping it but that's what he meant um so it was interesting he agrees with you um the offensive coordinator def- definitely agrees with that it being an execution issue and i think you saw josh even reference why are you so good under two minutes you know, whether it's the end of the game or the end of the half, you guys are, I think, the top of the league in most statistical categories at the end of two minutes. And it's because it's the predictability has gone. The defense can't rush in packages. They can't call certain plays out. Um, you know, it's some stuff is, is, is off script. It's random. Yeah, that relies have more heavily on 
Josh be right. Josh in those moments, right? And that's humanity. Yeah, absolutely. That's when we're out of And that's, that's, you know, I, I think originally, why did, I, Aaron, the one question I have, and I've, I've thought about this more lately than I did early, why did Josh lobby for Dorsey? What's your opinion? Obviously, obviously we know the, the you know, he's been there, you know, the continuity. But what is, what is Comfort, your opinion yeah. on why Josh would have lobby to the point where, you know, by all accounts, they were bidding against the Giants, you know, at points in the offseason? Right. Well, so this one's a complicated one for me because I do think it's mostly comfort based, right? Like Josh is still a young guy in the NFL who's had a lot of success. He's seen a lot of football, but he's still a young dude in this league. And now he's gotten this big contract from the team. He is clearly the franchise guy. And you're having your first major shift to that offense and potentially shift in offensive philosophy in a major way, right? Like if Dorsey goes, we don't know who that replacement is. There's a lot of unknown. So I think he probably, this is a total speculation, this is the fear of the unknown of who you're going to have versus the comfort of somebody you've gone to battle with, you've had in your ear, you've had on the sideline. There's a lot of comfort there. There's conversation, like all that stuff already pre-exists. And, but my concern, and it was always my concern with Josh having that much say, I think he deserves a voice in the room. I think it gets dangerous when you give too much say to that, uh, to any type of player in that way, because now... Obviously, Josh isn't tied to Dorsey. If Dorsey fails, Josh isn't going anywhere. But, you you know, if this doesn't work out, this Dorsey experiment doesn't work out, you really hurt yourself in a prime window. I don't think it's going to be as bad as that. I do think this offense is good enough to be where they are right now, which is first in the AFC. I think that they're uh, still the one of the top favorites to win a Super Bowl. I'm not trying to sound like a downer here. Um, but I think Josh leaned into that for comfort. But... This Beasley signing, sort of back to the topic of this, to me, I feel like there may be some tension in how the offense is performing despite the statistics and despite the success that they have had, like we talked about. It seems like maybe there's some tension in the building about how it's operating and what they believe the long-term success can be. And that's why you're seeing the John Brown come in and why a Cole Beasley's Yeah, in. I mean, I think you hit it on your head is – I'm not saying it's not important to other quarterbacks. You know, we don't watch film. We don't talk about, we don't in-depthly analyze, you know, the Buccaneers. But for the Bills specifically, right, right. like, it's very, very important uh, with continuity and who he knows. But not only in the front office yeah. and the staff, they've always signed Carolina players. They've signed X players. But Josh, I mean, look at Josh himself now saying, like, continuity is really, really important. I want John Brown back, even in a limited role. I need Cole Beasley back. I mean, that definitely points to who he is. Um, and definitely points to the fact that I think the whole topic's full circle with Dorsey, um, and and that's a really important thing for him. Like, it's not – it might not be for other quarterbacks. I, I don't really know. I'm not inside Mike White or Zach Wilson's I, head. I mean, we've seen, we've seen Tom Brady consistently lean into guys that he has had some success with, not even always big names, but – this is battle. You know, we even talked about, we heard uh, the reports coming out from the gentleman, I forget his name, uh, from WIVB or VIB, um, who was on this this morning. Um, and his tweet was essentially saying, hey, this was led by Josh, bringing back both Brown and Beasley, and that the locker room was cool with it. I never had any questions that the Buffalo Bills locker room was cool with bringing back Cole Beasley. I think people don't understand what, like what these guys do in terms of like going to battle together and you can have those differences of opinion. Like we heard the way Lorenzo Alexander talked about Richie incognito. We know it. Richie incognito is a flawed human being that said a lot of bad things and did a lot of bad things. And I'm sure guys in the locker room didn't agree with the things he's done and said, but they went to battle with this guy. And that gives you a level yeah. of respect that maybe the outside world can't understand because we're so divisive. We're so like, if you don't agree, we don't talk locker rooms aren't like that. And so I do think, you know, outside of those optics and, and things like that with the locker room, I think it matters on game day, having trust in people. This is the same with the coaching staff. There's all this talk about why isn't Kyrie Elam in there. Coaching staffs also tend to go with guys they trust. Even if it's a guy that's failed in spots, if they've had NFL production, they usually go with the you know the devil they know versus the one they don't. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, look at Aaron Rodgers is still doing it with Randall Cobb. He did it with James Jones. Um, you know, he he, yeah. he he's still like absolutely you know prefers who we prefer. And that's, I mean, that's going to be Josh someday where he's calling up old Stephon Diggs um, at some point uh, right. late in his career. I mean, it's it's definitely going to exist. 
And I think what's funny is you're right. Like, I mean, Rich Incognito was a terrible person. Like he bullied somebody out of the league. I mean, what, what, that's not good. Um, you know, that's, right. but you know, you do go to bed. I mean, you spend as much time with these guys as your family. Um, the, I mean, they're in second homes a lot of times. Like, you know, they don't, they don't get to go home until after the season, depending on the player. Um, so right. there's definitely situ- situations that- where they build these bonds and, and Gabe Davis is like literal best friends with Cole Beasley. Yeah. We saw Isaiah McKenzie's literally going to lose reps because of this signing. If it goes as we assume that it will, there's a chance Cole Beasley doesn't provide anything for sure. But if we're assuming this is what it's being reported as, and he is the player we think he is, Isaiah McKenzie could be losing reps. And he was openly like, tweeting at Cole Beasley in a, what I'm assuming is to get him on this team. Uh, this wide receiver room when Beasley was here, man, I don't know if people remember some of the videos that were out there of like them at Chad Hall's house, giving him a truck. Like it was a very tight knit group uh, between all these guys. And so I think you bringing him back in is fantastic. As much as I was up for the OBJ signing uh, when that was coming up in terms of what I believe his talent level is, uh, you don't know what that chemistry is going to do. I don't worry about OBJ as a locker room cancer necessarily. Like I don't buy into all that stuff, but you just don't know how that's going to interact when you introduce somebody new. They know exactly what Cole Beasley brings to this team. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think that that's, that's a good point and that's really important. And, and I, I tend to think like culture and like having him there and some of his expertise and helping him on third down is what you're going to get from Cole Beasley. Like we've already talked about, are you going to get five to 10 catches yet? I don't know. I don't know if we'll see that. Um, but I do think like expectations in line, like he definitely provide, I mean, these players provide a presence in the receiver room, just like Vaughn provides a presence in the D line room, just like Micah Hyde provides a presence in the DB room. Um, and yeah. it feels like they need it to like some off script stuff. I mean, Cole Beasley's great at that. And that's why him and Josh mesh show well. Um, and I think you could immediately see, and it, it is going to become roster crunch time. We have Jamison Crowder rehabbing to come back, you know, you know, what's, what's right. going to happen with the roster where it only has four receivers. So you do have a spot or two to put on your active roster at the receiver position. Um, you know, but it is going to come, you know, I have Ike Butker coming back here. I assume, uh, you know, could be as soon as this week could be next week. Um, so you do have some re- some small reinforcements coming back uh, in a way. In right, a way. Right. And I, I've looked through the injuries. Like, you could have legitimately your entire team by the playoffs bearing no injuries uh, beside Von Miller. Yeah, right. Um, and, you know, we have different, differing opinions around the Micah Hyde situation um, and where that might end up. But I just think that – I do. My opinion – yeah, my opinion on that is I just don't know. Like, necks are so hard. I'd hate yeah. to even – yeah, no, I'll, I'll wait and see on that. That's right. Yeah, I'm no, at. that's fine. And franchise players, and you know, look at the hockey team across town, has straight up <laughs> changed right. the course of their franchise based on neck injuries. Um, yeah. Yeah, for better or for worse, it's up to you to decide um, with, with neck injuries. So you're right. They're very complicated. It's not just rehabbing an ankle. Um, but the players seemingly working out full bore, and we've heard, you know, we've heard from local reporters yeah. saying, like, we don't see this. Um is, is pretty interesting. It's an interesting note that um, mm-hmm. you could conceivably see him checking doctor's boxes and, pu- and push to play in the, the divisional or, or uh, AFC championship game. So more, more the point is that the team's going to be, could be healthy coming into the playoffs. Um, and where do all these roster spots sit? And, you know, you only have three elevations a season. John Brown's already at two. You know, you're not going to see Brown and Beasley every day. Um, you know, you can't. You're not going to elevate both of those receivers from the practice squad. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. Well, so Brown will only have one yep. more elevation. He can only play one more game this season unless the Bills put him on his, their active roster, which – On the active roster. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure where the roster That's going to get come. tricky. That is going to get tricky um, in terms of, yeah, and even how they handle Cole. Like, is that something where they're getting him on the active roster? I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. I do like the idea of having to balance too many options, right? Like, too many ways to attack a team. And I do think, like, one, I believe Cole Beasley is not far removed from actual good production. I think that we forget that as fans it was like less than a year ago that he was still 
doing productive things for this offense, even into the playoffs. He had some huge catches in those games to keep the chains moving, doing exactly the things Cole Beasley was known for here in Buffalo. And so even if he's not necessarily productive, like you said, I'm not expecting to get seven, eight targets and catches a game out of Cole Beasley, but his presence, even if they put him in on a third and medium or third and long, even teams were in the playoffs, dude, teams were still bracket coveraging. Like they were trying to take away Beasley and Diggs. Like that was the Bills offense. And that's what teams did to try to limit them. I think defensive coordinators see Beasley come out of the field, even if it's this weekend, and you have to account for that with the past of what you've seen on film with him and Allen. That's yeah. something that has to be accounted for. You see, you see, I don't know if you've seen him yet, the Isaiah McKenzie tweet. Um, no. What you... I, I just pinned it to our to our uh, Jumbotron. He's our anti-vax loser, um, per Isaiah McKenzie. Also saying, the floor is yours, are, are the tweets that he just, the floor is yours, brother, is the tweets he just had. Oh, because somebody wrote he's our anti-vax loser. He's that anti-vax loser. He said they said he's our anti-vax yeah. loser. Yeah, I don't. It's I, it's uh, polarizing. He's going to be polarizing sorry. for sure. Yeah, go ahead, man. My bad. I didn't mean to cut off. I just wanted to point out too because you guys were talking about Crowder before. I think everything you're seeing, offensive struggle at least in the slot, is a direct domino effect of him getting hurt. I think even though his time was brief. When you saw him on the field, Allen was looking his way like he used to look for Beasley. That was his security blanket. And I thought Crowder was actually starting to do a good job, even though he had a slow training camp and everything. Him going down gave the role to McKenzie fully, and I just think right. McKenzie not delivering is what gets you Beasley back. And Beasley being that veteran, like I'll take my personal opinions of him out of this because obviously I could go on a tangent about that, but... You know, I think just having his presence in the locker room is enough for these guys, too, even if he barely gets any snaps. Like, it's bees. You know, they all love him. He probably can fire them up the same way Vaughn's firing up group. And you're going to have a bunch of guys who have their friend there. When he gets on the field, great. When he's not, they'll probably be giving tips, especially to the guys struggling in the slot. Yeah, I think a little bit of this is overstated, too. Like, I mean, maybe Khalil Shakir benefits from this of having that expertise of slot receiving. Um, but like Isaiah McKenzie's a veteran at this point who had that already. He's beyond that. So I don't know if there's any saving there. And I, I think that I've said this all along with or without Beasley. I thought this was one of the best wide receiver rooms in terms of experience, in terms of coaching and in terms of, you know, what kind of room they have in terms of tightness. And so when they drafted Shakira, I was like, this is a great room for him with or without Beasley. I think adding him is definitely a benefit. But to me, the real benefit of bringing in a Cole Beasley here is trying to provide something else that defenses have to seriously account for, even if it's not necessarily targeted production. Right. Yeah. And I think what's important about the ability to have as many weapons as possible to that topic was back in training camp, we felt like we had a good problem and that was a good, a good feeling at times, not a good feeling for our roster, our fake roster projections. Um, but a good, a good yeah. feeling for the team in general, you know, and then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, that feeling kind of disappeared. Like, why aren't they using Shakir as a big Shakir fan in the draft? And, you know, what we right. saw in Pittsburgh and, and a couple of, 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 of other flashes, you know, similar to the Elam debate is like, they relied on Benford a little bit. They felt comfortable with him as a six round rookie. What's the situation around a first round pick and around uh, Shakir uh, who seemingly could have helped you, but you know, we don't know the intricacies of what's going on day to day with, with, with Shakir. Um, and clearly he's been in the system long enough to know, like if they didn't feel like they needed Brown and Beasley, they wouldn't have gotten Brown or Beasley because Shakir would have taken those snaps. Um, you know, he's still playing 25% of the snaps at Shakir. I would, ex- I would expect as much as even McKenzie, those are some of the snaps given to Cole Beasley. Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think I think I think those twenty five percent of snaps combination of uh, you know plucking a few snaps from a couple of players. I wouldn't be shocked to see Cole in there in, in routes and um, you know that was the first thing I was told last night was he was watching third down packages whatever that. Means. Yeah, I mean that probably makes the most sense for where you get immediate impact from Colby is in terms of what we saw his success in this offense in years past. I'm kind of interested to know. And I don't think we'll get the answer anywhere uh, in the media and and, in the press conferences is so we've heard that this was Josh Allen driven in terms of getting Beasley. We know Dorsey was Josh Allen driven. I'm interested to know if there is 
maybe a little frustration or um, anxiety or tension to get this offense going and whether that's personnel driven and getting these guys in, or if it's philosophically driven and getting the right type of pieces to bring the offense back to what they were. Doing. Have you heard the, and you and just through Josh, he, you know, Josh love, you know, Josh is a really great guy. He does radio interviews, and, you know, Kyle's baseman yeah. and, um, whatever it may be, but he's always alluded to the fact of his recruit, his uh, recruiting failures as a quarterback in terms of, you know, they were, at, you know, obviously OBJ was the topic and he alludes to his, right. his failures of getting players to play. And that's when he has referenced Christian Kirk. He really put on, he put on a full port, uh, court press for Christian Kirk, including offsite events. And I think golf matches, I forgot what charity yeah. event he was, he's referenced. Well, hard no offense to Josh, hard to compete with that paycheck, Kirk. Right. So, I mean, that, right. that seemingly is a good thing um, that, like, it wasn't you, Josh. It was he got paid. Yeah, yeah um, right. <laughs> um, and he's been silently really good, Christian Kirk, um, this season. Yeah. You know, a lot of people said that's a terrible contract. I mean, they said that about John Brown when he first signed. I mean, it's – it's he's going for a 1,000 yards. You know who's been sneaky, decent over there, too, is Zay Jones. Yeah, he has Probably. been, actually. Has been like an okay wide receiver. I mean, he yeah. kind of helped beat Tennessee on his. I mean, he was really good um, in yeah. that game, uh, which is funny. And he, we all saw the talent with Zay, though. I mean, Zay was Zay with those those drops, polarizing. Um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Zay was a weird situation in Buffalo. Very polarizing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's this isn't a foreign topic to us. Um, no. No, for sure not. I see Chris Kepner in here. What's going on, Chris? What's up, guys? I've been uh, hesitant to jump in because I missed uh, a bunch at the beginning here. I had to, you know, uh, <laughs> my, my my kid's home today and my wife's got COVID. So, um, oh, <laughs> got, hope everyone's feeling all right, buddy. Yeah, you know, we're we're hanging in there, but uh, yeah, yeah, some some big news today. Pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Do you? So obviously you've been in a bunch of these spaces where we talked about the offense. We talked about it in getting OBJ was really where our focus was in terms of bringing in a talent um, to kind of to where I'm trying to find out about this offense. Do you think it was a move that is just personnel based and let's get more weapons and add more gas? Or was it, Hey, these guys match a philosophy of how we used to play offense. And I want to get back to that. Um. I think that there's certainly something that's been missing and this, it, it feels to me like, you know, an attempt to get back to that. Right. Like I'm a little bit skeptical that, that Cole's going to be able to play at the level he was in 2020. Um, was I mean, the he, level he finished 2021 in good enough for you? Um, sure. I mean, well, you know, it, it depends. <laughs> I think it's all about expectation, right? Because it was it was uh, not uh, the same, right, at the end of twenty twenty one as it was in prior years. Um, would that be an improvement over what we have now? Yeah, I think so. Um, but <laughs> you know, I think if I had you know uh, like a magic wand and could say like, okay. Bibbity boppity bills. Here's the best offense on the field. Like Khalil Shakir, you know, coming along and developing into that slot is probably in the long term uh, what I think is our best shot in terms of like what we've got there on the roster now. Um, and Beasley coming in, like you guys were just talking about, um, probably d- it takes away some of the opportunities from him to, uh, to develop, but it's a, it's, that's a kind of a short term issue. And I think that, um, you know, Beasley does, if he can play even at that 2021 level, he, he gives Josh a certain amount of confidence, um, that, you know, probably is in the short term, a bigger advantage, right, for the team than than Khalil Shakir Shakir's development. Um, so that's right. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting, like philosophical. Like he's had this twenty five percent of snaps now and hasn't been able to do it. At what point do you start to get antsy? Here, as we get towards yeah, the but how many tar- how many that... targets has he had though? 
Yeah, but how many targets does he earn, right? Like, and is the trust there? And yeah, exactly. Like, and I, I get what you're saying. Like, the preference is that he comes along and fills that role. And I don't know why it's not picking up in the way that you know I projected that it would. But I can see as a staff and as a uh, in that locker room of getting antsy this time of year of like, okay, like still want to see that from him, but we got to get something going here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that makes got, a lot of sense. Nick Bags had uh, requested to speak. So what's up, dude? Hey, Aaron. Uh, uh, thanks for letting me talk. I just had uh, wanted to bring up something. I missed the beginning, but I wanted to ask if you guys talked about um, – my biggest issue is that we let Isaiah Hodgins go, and I thought he could have been a nice, a nice step up. He's shown the last couple of games against the, the Giants, scored two touchdowns. Um, I know we had Stevens in two. I don't know if you guys talked about him being called up too, but uh, – I don't think McKenzie's the answer with the drops he's had. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, man. I'll, I can start with there. I think um, I like Hodgins fine. I do. I still believe he's like a barely rosterable wide receiver in the NFL. Um, I also think that we're maybe overstating the two touchdowns. Like that one touchdown against the Eagles is kind of garbage time. They were already up 22 nothing. Like that game was already out of hand. Like good for him. I don't think he's playing for the Giants if they're fully healthy either. I think he would be a barely rosterable player for them um, if they didn't have so many injuries to uh, their wide receiving core. I'm happy for him. I'm happy he's having success. I still think he could be a good developmental player. What he was in college was a guy that caught the ball, which is what the Bills need right now. But I still don't think if he was on this roster, I don't think he cracks a game day active, and I think they still bring him easily. Kevin? What do you think, man? I think what's funny about I, I, I was actually I had this on my topic for my show tonight um, was the fact that going through the roster, right? He wasn't even we we can we've all sat here on the stage this morning at least, and you know in our of our shows and, and Twitter in general and talked about you know, the issues with the receiving room or the issues with um, you know production at the receiver position or the offense in general or asking Dorsey why aren't we creative enough you know, whatever these combination of these factors are. And the fact was he didn't make that roster. He didn't make the team felt like they needed to keep special. And I'm, I'm all, I, I complain about special team players, but I don't win the teams like number one or two in special teams DVOA. I'm not going to complain about special teams. Um, right. You know, when they're 30th, I might complain about wasting roster spots on special teams. Um, now, Fast forward to I, they. They team felt like they wanted to roster a bunch of special teams linebackers, DBs, you know, Cam Lewis, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Whoever um, over Isaiah Hines right. at a position that we're going out and signing veterans at. Um, so, in my opinion, um, this, he was this team's seventh or eighth receiver, even playing at his at his top notch. That's how good this receiver yeah. room is. And now he's sitting in the Giants as like their number one or two receiver. So. Um, I, I'm comfortable in, in, in using that as an as 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 how good the actual receiving room is, and yeah, like he did get beat up by Khalil Shakir, and um, if if Khalil Shakir, we we just talked about him, isn't gonna you know earn the targets or get the targets either way, you know we we we, we certainly shouldn't expect Isaiah Hodgins, who the team couldn't find a roster spot for, to be productive. And I do agree with though Nick, uh, your point. I do think maybe because of what Joe's point was. Crowder goes down early in camp, right at the start of camp, and uh, McKenzie is able to have that job. I was never sold that Isaiah McKenzie was a wide receiver three. I really think he is more borderline four five gadget dude, which is a fine role for him. But I do think that that conversation probably needs to actually happen now that he's not the wide receiver three that people think he is, that he is more of a less reliable uh, target type of guy where you, you design some plays for him and get him into space. Yeah, that's that's definitely where he fits and where he's successful. And, and it's obviously when you're successful at that four or five role of people wanting more, right? You're like, oh, I like the taste of that. Yeah. Let's get him up to a second or third, you know, uh, receiver two or three targets. Yeah. And that speed, that speed can be intoxicating, right? You see the potential where it can bust at any point, right? Especially in man coverage, and you we've seen the games where he basically uh, bodied Miles Bryant from from New England himself. Um, yeah. And that's that's just a plus matchup for the Bills, and it continue and will continue to be. And we've seen it be in certain man coverages. We've seen it be a, a plus matchup for the Bills, Detroit, um, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, where that's going to be something that maybe is schemed game to game, and um, you know something that we've seen on the cornerback room with will they continue to rotate based on game plan, and that's what they'll do with the receiver position. You want as many talented players as possible to to beat certain coverages. 
Have you guys no. talked much yet about um, Josh's role in the signings of Brown and Beasley? Yes, we. So that's sort of where my question to you a little bit earlier led into of uh, um, the philosophical. Is it um, personnel based, or are they frustrated with the offense? Because Josh also, we kind of really got into Josh pounding the table. Kevin brought that up, but Josh pounding the table for Dorsey. You know, now he's bringing these guys in. Um, and so I'm interested to know, is it frustration of Dorsey not being more of what they thought he was going to be in terms of uh, creative offense like Dable, or if it's, hey, we don't have the personnel to do the things we want to do that Dable was doing? To me, it's a really interesting development in, in, in the long term as far as uh, Josh's role on the team and its personnel. Um, and it's almost like... Uh, it's almost a bit of an experiment, right? That's if, right. If it if it doesn't work out, well, then everybody learns something, especially Josh, right? Like maybe going back to what was comfortable, what worked before, isn't always the best thing. But if it does, then you know, Josh feels like he got like the team supported what he wanted. Mm-hmm. Either way, right? Um, it's just really interesting to me how. Um, Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott have shown uh, a willingness to, you know, listen to Josh and to get him the the tools that he thinks are going to best suit the team. It's a fine line, I, me, though. I think, like, you look at LeBron James has not always been successful in having say in what a franchise does. Yeah. And he's the, maybe one of the greatest, not better than Jordan, but he's one of the greatest players that ever played his sport. So being good and being your franchise's best player doesn't always equal success in making those decisions. But I do think there's probably a balancing act between how much they actually care about the production versus uh, making Josh happy, right? Like these aren't big moves that are going to hurt the franchise. Yeah. These are moves that are sort of low, low Low risk, risk, right? If they don't work out, there's, well, that's, that's what's back to the Christian Kirk point. Why that, that I brought that up. That was a high, like Aaron, you mentioned the paycheck. That was a higher risk recruit by, by Josh that, you know, obviously they, didn't quite have the cap space they could have, um, but they allocated it elsewhere. But that's what's right. interesting is this Josh bring that up. Hey, guys, I asked for Christian Kirk. I know he was expensive. He's been productive kind of on a non-playoff team or, or borderline playoff team. This is what could have taken our offense to the next level. Was that part of, Chris, to your point, was that part of what he pointed to now that he's getting some of these players that he's asking for? Um, did he say, hey, like I, I said that this guy could have been good in our offense. Um, I know his money situation was different. So I do think we'll see some of that develop as he becomes who he is. And let's not turn it into a situation to where we're trying to get bargain bin receivers because Josh is so good. You know, we want it, We want a situation to receivers like we did early in his career, like Diggs helps elevate the play of Josh. And it is interesting that, I mean, he's not dumb. He knew what Christian Kirk would cost. Um, it is, it is interesting to know, like, Josh is going to be very active in saying, you know, who he needs to be successful based on what he thinks his strengths are. I think this team drafts a wide receiver in the first two I, rounds. I that's, this that's Hi, Mike. Yeah. Uh, I don't watch a ton of college football this time of year, but my new draft philosophy is draft Ohio State wide receivers until you hit on a stud. <laughs> Just keep doing it. <laughs> You're going to hit on a stud here in a year or two. Right? Marvin Harrison's not coming out this year, right? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> that would be awesome, uh, <laughs> Logan. What's up, man? Yeah, um, I just wanted to expand on uh, the uh, Josh Allen point. I personally feel like the like it's a obviously a good thing because you don't want to have like the severed relationship between front office and QB, and I also I don't want to have to deal with like the Aaron Rodgers type stuff every year mm. with like oh he's mad and whatnot, but. At the same time, like Aaron, to your point, I love the also I love the subtle. He's not better than Jordan when you're talking about LeBron. Where <laughs> we can't sacrifice, um, we can't sacrifice like players that like Jimmy mean, maybe the front office believes in for guys that Josh wants. Like, um, I think you guys really hit the nail on the head well there. But at the same time, also it's kind of concerning to me because it shows that he kind of some of the stuff where we're like, hey. Josh doesn't look completely comfortable or like he trusts anyone mm. in Dorsey's offense. Um, I just want, in general, just more layups, and I think Cole Beasley helps that. Another thing with Beasley coming back that um, 
is something that is a little interesting to me with how this offense is going to operate. We saw uh, Eric did a breakdown a few years ago talking about how there was a uh, play from Beasley ran in college that he talked about with Dable was a play that he was comfortable with and a concept that he was super comfortable with. We saw the Bills implement it. Now I'm interested to see, like, we saw during that time, we, Kevin and I were just talking about it, the similarities or the, for reference, where the team was at week 14 a year ago versus where they were today. And at week 14 a year ago, you had a lot of people calling for Dayball's head. You had a lot of people calling for more Isaiah McKenzie. We need Jeb, but we need something to fix this offense, right? But during that time, I heard countless players, Stephon Diggs, Cole Beasley, Josh Allen, defending Dable and saying, like, he's one of the best offensive coordinators we've ever been around. I absolutely love Dable. I love going to battle for him. We really have not heard that defense, and we're getting questions in the media about the offense, and nobody I haven't really heard has come out and been like, oh, my God, Ken Dorsey is the best. He's absolutely the best. He's creative. He takes into, you know, what we want to do with this offense, and those are the things we've heard about Dable. I'm interested with Cole Beasley coming back and having a voice and not being able to – and being – willing to speak his voice if we see Dorsey take some of the players, you know, uh, suggestions with this offense. I think Dorsey is one of, um, has kind of developed his game plan more about like kind of attacking the other D like the opposing team's defense versus where I feel like Dable was a guy that kind of said, okay, this is our bread and butter. This is how we, this is how we score our points. We're going to try this, but he's also very adaptable in game. I feel like yeah. Dorsey dictating. kind of, tr- we were dictating. We were dictating. Yeah, exactly. 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 Like, but I feel like Dorsey kind of runs concepts that like, like, which is this is kind of right, kind of not. They're pretty vanilla and stuff in terms of just trying to attack the defense like it's like oh well they're run- they're running cover three so this deep over should be effective here versus like versus but he's got to and now he's got get Josh the RPO Allen. game going. You got Eric Turner talking about he's got Josh Allen doing like half field reads. It's like half field and run. Like that's too. We're we're past that with Josh Allen. It needs to be there's he can handle more complex offenses and it doesn't need to be hey if you don't see the read we need you to make a play and keep this offense moving. That's as good as he is, and he's been doing it, the statistics show he's been doing it, it's a tough thing to consistently rely on, especially when you start to get into the playoffs, the game slows down, coordinators are pulling things out. It, uh, you've got to be able to depend on other guys. Yeah, I kind I mean, of disagree. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, yeah, for example, I mean, if you look at a bunch of uh, – like, if you look at a bunch of the other top QBs in the league, like, the one I always like to point to is, like, Mahomes in Kansas City. Like, he has Andy Reid. There's, like, you could make an argument that, like, 70% of that offense is, like, getting them in, is getting uh, Mahomes in rhythm and scheming guys open and whatnot. Like, versus, like you said, it's kind of just on Josh's shoulders here. But, yeah. Joe, you had a point? Yeah, I was going to say I kind of disagree with the midfield thing, or the uh, half field because I do think he is taking deep shots, but I also think that this is kind of an indictment on Davis because I know Davis has that, you know, that stat of, you know, highest y- amount of yards per reception, but it's not consistent enough. And I know that on the stat sheet, you'll see he's almost at a thousand yards. He makes these catches, but I feel like a lot of the reason why they can't go more than half field is because they can't because Diggs is going to get bracketed. Davis on a one-on-one might get open, but he's not as reliable as we thought he would be. And I think that's an issue as to why you want to go vertical is you really can't outside of Diggs. Yeah, it, does it seem to you, Aaron, like like Davis uh, doesn't have the uh, ability to get that separation quickly in the way that someone like Diggs or even, you know, Prime Beasley could do? Yeah, it seems maybe, he, yeah, he takes a second to get to top speed. I do still see him breaking – the top off defenses at time to get those long developing plays though the offensive line has to play with consistency and i don't think we've seen that and, uh, you know, well even beyond that. like the beyond like the speed element like the you know getting getting space in the short and intermediate areas i do think he struggles to get space in some of the short and intermediate stuff um right now and what, what's more concerning is the lack of consistency in catching the ball and i'm not a big yes. guy that like harps on drops as much as other people do but I do think there is a mental aspect to a relationship with a quarterback and a wide receiver where over time you only get so many possessions in this game in a game, right? Like, and if, if a drop 
does kill a possession, that's can be really devastating in the league. Like it, Kevin and I, when we used to do a show together, Kevin, you know, we talked about it all the time. It's like five, six plays that separate most NFL games. And if they're drops and they're, they're, you know, good passes that has to have yeah. an impact on a quarterback and, and where they're willing how many, to go. How many drops were in, in uh, what did we have on Sunday against the Jets? How many drops did we have in that game? Sis hasn't come out with the data. I know PFF's drops data is a little off sometimes, but what was it like five? I think they had on PFF. Yeah, and go, going back to going back to Beasley, I think he doesn't really drop the ball that much. He's a security blanket for Josh. So now I'm just kind of kind of a little happy that I think he will definitely be seeing the field, and uh, he doesn't really drop the ball that much. So I think that's kind of why they that healthy he doesn't. Him. That's that's when so. he's when he's healthy and prime Beasley. He's not. He is not dropping the football. Yeah. Um, he had a couple of annoying ones late in the season last year, but nothing, nothing crazy. Nothing like what we're seeing. He wasn't at his prime late late in the season last year either. So to to Kevin's point, like prime, you know, prime Beasley. Hopefully, we get something closer. Well, yeah, I think we're past prime at this point. Yeah, um, it, it is an interesting topic but, of of drops in the situation of that. I mean, I mean. Why it's interesting to me is that Dorsey even alluded to it. Like, that's not how we are. As a team. He said this in his press conference yeah, yesterday. PFF, by the way, PFF had it at four total drops. One on McKenzie, two, or two on McKenzie, one on Singletary, and one on Knox. And the Bills just made it official, signing him to the practice squad and signed Brandon Bryant to the yeah. practice squad as well. Releasing CJ Brewer and releasing, saw that one releasing Marcus Stevenson from the practice squad. Mm. Also saw that coming. So that's there's your updates for the Stevenson day. Stevenson doesn't really have a he doesn't really uh, have a spot on the team anymore. In my poor opinion. Ryan Sullivan, my thoughts and prayers with Ryan Sullivan. Sports Rock, thoughts to you. Um, but yeah, I mean Cole Beasley. I mean that's that should be that should all be signs that like the Bills thought they upgraded with Cole Beasley over who they currently had. In you know to the Hodgins question as well. Um, you know they 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 think that you know they didn't present much into this offense. So. Uh, it's it's definitely going to be an interesting couple of you know a couple of weeks here with how they ramp up Cole and um, I think you can point to Jerry Jones being very transparent in the fact that like you know did OBJ come in here saying he could play and then not be able to play um, and maybe the Bills felt the same way um, that Jerry said uh, you know hey we're we're spending a December visit with you by all accounts you're you know you're supposed to be able to to help us not only achieve the, our ultimate goal but maybe help us achieve. You know, one C situation. I, I also wonder if the comments Chris sort of talked about on his show, on the the show or whatever, the shop, maybe rub some teams the wrong way in terms of like, even if teams were willing to wait it out, the like kind of selfish way it came out may have turned some teams off too and said like, hey, whatever, it's not, you know, if we're not going to get the production we expect this year, I don't want to deal with this. Like he's clearly out for number one. And even the way we heard Von Miller sort of trying to sell it to him on the Twitch of saying, like, where can you uh, get the most individual success and kind of harping individual success over and over again. I could see a Sean McDermott kind of souring on that over and over again. Yeah, Vaughn's a huge individual success guy. Like, he says that that is team success. Um, That's Correct. Yeah, that... And I can get it. That's his whole, like, thing. Um, it It doesn't sound great. No. It doesn't. It doesn't sound good. I don't. I don't know. I don't know, guys. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't say that the signings of T. Y. Hilton and Cole Beasley mean that either team is out on OBJ. I think it means this year, though, right? They're out. Mm, I don't know. I'm not. I don't. I just. I wouldn't say that yet. I think. I would be pretty surprised the way John Brown left the Bills and came back. He wasn't happy when he left the Bills. The way Cole Beasley yeah, left he the Bills was hurt. back, he wasn't happy the way he left the Bills. Them bringing them those guys back, there's some stuff behind the scenes that all some conversations behind the scenes that also had to occur for them to come back. I would be very shocked at this point if they did anything to not have those guys on the team because I like those relationships matter to Brandon Bean. We know what he talked about with that Washington Commanders trade. And how he's going to remember how that business dealing was dealt. I don't think he wants to put those guys back in a position where they leave Buffalo with a bad taste in their mouths, personally. And, but maybe OBJ coming wouldn't have anything impact on them. But I would think it would have to. I I see your, I see what you're saying. I just don't know that. Um, I mean, we're talking about guy uh, two receivers that 
and it's not like other teams are out there trying to get them at this point, right? Like I think that they could have a meaningful impact for the Bills, but I wouldn't put them, you know, <laughs> as like how many how many teams are out there right now besides the Cowboys who just signed T.Y. Hilton, who's kind of in the same area and space, and the Bills, like how many teams are out there right now seeking that guy that are a top contender that can add a guy at this point in the year that's going to make a difference? Yeah, well, I mean, but they're, those guys, those teams are trying to add OBJ, right? Like, they just oh, – he doesn't like the numbers. It's a, that's at least what it seems like. Or he's think, really physically not able to play yet. Yeah, I think that's a, I, I think that's true. But I think that uh, McDermott made some comments after the visit that kind of led me to believe that they were okay being patient with him in, in terms of the, the injury and not playing immediately. Uh, the, I took the comments to mean that they were not concerned with him not working out in the facility. Because he was asked directly, like, did he work out? And are you concerned about that? And he was just kind of like, no. I also think Sean McDermott is just going to say stuff to the media that just sounds yeah. not <laughs> um, controversial in any way. As much as he can. Right. He says he's, he's a master at saying something without saying anything. Yeah. Well, we even heard Josh talk about on Kyle Brandt's podcast. Like, that is very much within the building the Belichick type of way of like, let's not give anything to anybody. Answer as generic as possible. Give all the cliches and get out of there. Um, which is why we saw the Bills PR probably so upset with Jerry Sullivan <laughs> because that doesn't elicit, it doesn't let everybody stay on track with some of that stuff. It, it cocks it up a little bit. But I've only got a couple minutes left. Again, I do got to go get my kid from pre-K here. So I, there's still some speakers here. If anybody wanted to last minute here, get any thoughts, questions, things in. Yeah, I wanted to just say real fast, because I have to go too. Chris, I agree. I don't think they're out on OBJ by any means. I think it's just the timetable for him shifted, which has been a trend all year. Every single time he was mentioned in the free agency conversation, felt like they were pushing back when he was going to play. And also, again, Beasley's on the practice squad. Brown was on the practice squad. Unless they signed them, the limited amount of returns. I think it's going to be similar to like a 2020, uh, who was it? Kenny Stills, where mm. we signed him for the, where we signed him to the playoff roster and he didn't play, or I think he had started a game or like was put in a game, but didn't really do much. I think you're just going to see a situation if they bring him in like that, where you have the playoff roster, you put an OBJ, one of those guys, if they're still here, just sits on the bench for the game and he starts. I don't think that OBJ needs a ramp up period in terms of being on the field. I mean, he uh, he's been hurt before. He this is something that we didn't get into much, but <clears throat> one of the things he said on the shop was he, you know, <clears throat> in reference to why he doesn't feel like he needs to play in the regular season is because he's played a lot of football and he knows that, you know, he knows by that by now that. Um, all of the training camp, all of the preseason stuff, it has its place, but nothing compares to those first five plays on the field. And he knows that, you know, with his body coming back from injury, once he's been on the field for five plays, he feels like he's back up to, you know, his, his old self. I struggle a little bit with <laughs> players' confidence in their own bodies as they age. Yeah. We saw Von Miller say that he was going to be back for the Jets game. Right, like he felt confident that that was good. I also think Trey White, I think, came into the summer expecting to be more ramped up than he was, and there was probably some disappointment there, which led to some of the mental struggle to get back within the year's time frame. And honestly, I love Trey White. I'm glad he's back. I'm glad he's back to 100% snaps. He looked like a player that's recovering from an injury at times and I would expect that with OBJ coming back to as much as he thinks he's would be ready to go I think just as you age it gets harder to recover from those things even though you've done it once before like they're still gonna he's still not a year removed he won't be a year removed from that surgery until after the Super Bowl it would be a pretty still impressive recovery to come back and be productive right? yeah I mean you look at look at Dawkins I mean he's playing through a, a high ankle sprain that he should have been out for but I mean, he didn't play his best game so I mean I think to your point and that's not an ACL uh, one of the things that so, uh, so Kevin and I did um, a space on Sunday and 
one of the things that we talked about, I mean, OBJ came up briefly, you know, if he comes in and all he does for you this year is <clears throat> catch two passes for 57 yards and a touchdown in the Super Bowl, and the Bills win by four, like, it was worth it, right? It was worth whatever they paid him. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. definitely seemingly yeah. so. Yes. I wouldn't be shocked, too, if, like, like, I don't think we're completely ruled out of OBJ, but kind of like what Joe said, where he's like could be a practice squad guy in the playoffs where we kind of let him get acclimated. And, like, if we go on a run, maybe, do I mean, in the AFC Championship game or in the Super Bowl, like, he gets activated. But if we get knocked out early, he could then go sign with a different contender and, like, do I mean, and do the same thing. I think it was, it was the one offensive lineman on uh, – I want to say it was on Indy two years ago that was came out of retirement and like joined, played played a game against us, got bounced, and then signed elsewhere for on a team still in the playoffs. I wouldn't be shocked if something like that happened either. I don't think it'd be practice squad. What well, what I meant, like yes, like sign him originally to the practice squad, but I meant more so that he's just in the expanded roster position and then he comes into a right. game to start. He would. He wouldn't be eligible for the practice squad because you can't sign him out. I, I don't. I don't see him signing a, a one month deal on on practice squad with with um, salary restrictions. Um, he has to go straight to the roster, especially if he wants a long, uh, semi long term deal. Yeah, but like I mean, I was more or less kind of projecting. Like, and obviously, like, I mean, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem like teams are too keen to give him a long term yeah, I mean, yeah, you could deal. be right. You could be right that he's not going to get that. Um, yeah. Like I- yeah, but I mean, I didn't. I wasn't aware that he wouldn't even be eligible for practice squad. But I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously for him, he has said it like multiple times. He wants that like long term, like multi year deal, so he can find a place to retire. But like, I do really guys, don't know if any team is going to be willing to do that. I'm sure there will be eventually. But do you guys think? I mean, at some point, he has to make a decision about: Am I going to put some tape out this year or wait till free agency? And I think now, I believe. The Bills gain some leverage with Beasley in terms of that. Um, if that there was a deal, that's out a there great point. That. And so now they can even sit back and wait a little bit more and let him come to that reality. Do you guys think the Bills gained a little leverage here in terms of like, okay, hey man, the deals come down a little, and here it is. We'd love to have you for the Super Bowl run. Take it or leave it. We're here either way. That's how they like to operate, right? They don't like to overpay if they can help it, and I think that. Uh... <clears throat> they know that he could help, but at the same time, they they feel like they can get it done without him. Yeah. So it's, if you're um, if you're OBJ, Chris, I think you're kind of looking at it like you either sign um, a long term deal or you, you don't put a film out. I think that's where he's what, what he's thinking. So either you sign a long term deal, active roster, acclimate playoffs, Super Bowl, whatever. But the best team with the best shot, um, and maybe you can still maybe he's still playing it out a little bit to make sure he's going to go to a team that he can put film out for like he can't not going to go to the Giants to be one and done in the playoffs or not make the playoffs I don't totally blame him if he can't play this week just take another week or two to make sure that he's picking the roster that's going to give him the best chance to put out good film um, especially this year where he's going to have limited games I just don't see the practice squad scenario or even like the one-year deal scenario I think he there's not enough benefit there for him to not be full strength for March's free agency period in a free agent class it's very weak at the receiver position I think well, we can all agree the best case scenario here is we're coming to the same point in the season we had last year where the team really started to click, except this year they've come in winning four in a row instead of going back and forth losing and winning. And so they're in a better position. And I do think this is the time of the year where schematically you've seen what works and what doesn't. And you, Sean McDermott talks about it a lot we're having honest conversations in this room. And so all the conversations that are happening on Twitter, these guys are smarter than all of us. Sean McDermott's forgotten more about football than any of us know. They're having these conversations. I do think we'll start to see, I think we're already seeing trends in the right direction with the offense, even though we're still frustrated. And I think that continues. So the best case scenario to me is these players that they brought in Brown Beasley add some production, add some, development to the scheme creativity to the scheme and that's enough for us to not even worry about this and if obj happens great 
but the best outcome is this starts rolling this week as they ramp into the playoffs. And we saw Aaron with the with the New England game taking steps in the right direction. And then I, I'm not going to discount a first half of of, of rain sleet. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm I'm sorry, I can't take the rain sleet as a and a great negative. defense. I'm not discounting yeah. the Jets. Yeah, the rain sleet mixed with the Jets defense, I I that favors the defense. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. And look, there's yeah, straight points. It it's the first time in like seven years or whatever it was. Um, I'm not I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock the 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 team's offensive performance with the rain sleet. Um, that favors D, but what doesn't favor D and what favors O could be slight snow. Um, so we'll see if he's able to get back on track this week with four to seven inches being called for. I don't hate that. I hate rain sleet. I don't hate four to seven inches. I've I would, been told would, four to seven inches isn't that impressive. Yeah, no, <laughs> oh, I know. I, I didn't want to use that range because it's, it's, it's too perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, when you say seven feet, you can't really get many jokes. <laughs> exactly. There's no. no jokes for feet. No. So that's why I like snow and feet. But when you, when you talk about four to seven, um, you, you're in trouble. It's right in the range. Yeah. Right. It's right. average. It's pretty average. <laughs> Somewhere it's, in it's, there. it's right there. Um, but Do you guys think Beasley's going to be active this week and I, get I snaps? Do. Yeah. Do. Yep. Yep. John Brown wants to use that longer. I don't know. It's a quick week. We got a quick turnaround here. Um it's hard. I'm going to say no just right now, um, but then definitely heading forward. What I about feel you? Like he will, I feel yes. like he does. I think that he like probably gets like the John Brown treatment in the sense of he'll be out there for a few snaps. Maybe mm-hmm. at least like for Beasley, they might try to like scheme like they might try to scheme him a few targets. Like or maybe they just like say, okay, here's like these few set plays on third and like medium or third and short. We're just gonna have you run these routes X Y and Z. Well, I don't think he's gonna. If, if it's Beasley in, are we? That's gonna be Shakir inactive. And no, so... it would be the same. It would just be no John Brown. No John Brown. Yeah. Yeah, they could always save his elevation. I feel like I like what John Brown added in terms of that deep, like I want to see more of that deep target they had. I think that was there for the. It was it was a tough game. It was a tough game for that, right? For that shot, yeah, yeah. I think that that's there in the offense. I don't love Josh Allen just pounded the table to get John Brown back on this team. I don't. I want to keep him active if that if that's what we think adds success. I don't think they are going anywhere. Yeah, maybe they, you know, maybe they don't uh, have as many linebackers uh, active or something Blast like that. Blasphemy. Don't Sneaky. let you <laughs> Sneaky and active could be McKenzie, too. Like, that could, like, I'm not sure. I think the fact they went out and signed Cole Beasley in general shows that, hey, Josh Allen isn't happy and he doesn't trust um, – uh, he doesn't necessarily trust McKenzie that much. McDermott's mad about the drops. We saw this last year in the punt return game where – they inactive McKenzie for Stevenson. I wouldn't be shocked if they do the same for Shakir now and Shakir takes over, could take over, not like primary slot duties, but he could split with like Beasley and, uh, yeah, I did. I they did, they I did know. bench him after the Colts rain sleet game yeah. last year. Do Where we he got caught benching? by the turf monster. Yep. Do we see a benching after the rain sleet game of this year? I don't know. It's possible, but I thought he would already be scratched at times this year and he wasn't. Um, so we'll see if they go that route. But, yeah, they could absolutely elevate Beasley um, and Brown. I mean, they've already said Beasley's, based on NFL Network reports, is going to go to the active roster. So you don't need to worry about his elevations. Right. Brown can only play one more game this year at this point. So um, are they saving it for something, or will it be this week in the snow? I don't know. So they could elevate both receivers and scratch um, McKenzie. They could scratch Shakira. They could scratch – Bale Inspector, you know, I mean, they'll get creative with their active and active list um, yeah. on game day. John We're also Brown coming also, up on. Oh, good. I was just going to say, John Brown is also a confirmed Dolphins killer. So you got <laughs> to get him in there. Um, I think, uh, where are we at on Jake Kumro? I mean, he's he went on IR he's like coming. four weeks ago, right? Yep. Yeah, he's working his way back, and like we were talking earlier, there's a possibility Crowder works his way back here coming up soon. So, again, that plays into this OBJ stuff, too. Like, if Crowder's back healthy, now you're talking about, like, a significant log jam heading into the playoffs of guys that you felt good enough to bring in at this point. Right. Yeah, it's – yeah. 
we've already said the reasons why you can't stash OBJ on the practice squad because then it's a one year deal. Right. Um, I don't see him coming back one year deal on a max salary of, I think you can go max out to maybe like a million. Like that's, that's just not what he's looking to do. Um, on a practice squad, one year deal with maybe some film out there now at a log jam position. I don't see it. You still have, yeah. you, regardless of how many players you have on the roster at that position, you still have a situation where if OBJ can play, he comes in and is probably immediately the second best receiver on the team. Yeah, I don't disagree if he's healthy. Yeah, I don't know where he's at. It's hard. I mean, yes, if he's the guy that he was in the Rams or maybe even slightly percent less. Um. I don't – I'm really interested to see Cole Beasley, man. I will tell you guys, I have beef with some of Cole Beasley's tweets and off-the-field stuff, and there's a nuance to that, so don't come at me on it. I'm welcome to discuss with anybody, but don't attack me. Um, but I pounded – It's fair. I pounded the table for Cole Beasley to be on this team continuing to last year. My take was that I wanted him to take less money. I wanted to renegotiate that deal so that I could open some stuff up uh, because I don't quite think he's what he was in 2020. But that doesn't mean I, I still think he had production. There was juice there left. And so I'm interested to see because I think that production ramped up. I think the optics of his season in 2021 were muddied by a rib injury that I don't think a lot of fans understand what that means. And it, it was absolutely all over tape, in and out of his cuts, some of the catches, some of what he did with the ball. But he still led the Bills in yak. He still was one of their best receivers. He still was targeted on third and da- third down like – he still was a productive slot wide receiver, much more than they've had this year. So, and that wasn't even a full year ago. So, I have to expect that some of that's still there. And he, it's not like he had a major injury he's recovering from. He's just been resting. Right. I still want to ask. I, I, we talked about this to start the space. I know we probably had some people in and out of the um, in and out of the listener section. We appreciate everyone tuning in for the hour, hour plus. Yes. I still want yeah, to ask on. him about the Tampa situation. Like, I, I, I know yeah. we're not going to get a ton. Um, I just want to see what he says. And like you said earlier, he is a very honest guy, (laughs) like too honest, um, too, too willing to talk, but I, you know, I don't see him slandering Tom Brady. Um, but I I am interested in hearing what he has to say about like, what will, what, what do you think will work right in Buffalo in this scheme with this quarterback, with this system, whatever, um, that didn't work that made you, you know, feel like football was over. And can you get back to a point where like, you know, if, if it wasn't a skill set issue, like, are you able to play? Like, are you feeling like you're passionate enough to play? So I don't think those are terrible questions to, to get to him. Can I, can I conjecture a little bit on that? Yeah. To me, I mean, it seems like it's Josh Allen and the chemistry there and, you know, the Bills being kind of a, a fun team to play for. I mean, I, I know that there's a lot of controversy around Cole within the fan base. It never seemed to me like that – carried over much in the locker room at least no, it wasn't sure. that apparent no um whereas like the bucks honestly like brady doesn't seem like that fun of a guy to play with <laughs> like he seems like a pretty he seems like he can, he can be laid back in the off season, but i don't know he seem uh he doesn't seem like it's a lot of fun to play on the box no maybe not and, and especially with their record and maybe he wasn't feeling a part of the team as he didn't but Maybe it's more of a, a good situation, Chris, to the Bills. Like, whereas, like, I don't feel this atmosphere that I did in Buffalo. Um, that's part of what I was missing here in Tampa. That that would be a perfect answer for him to say. Would be like because I didn't feel, you know, like I could help like I do here or something like that. Along those, some something like that. Cole Beasley is just uh, obviously less than a year removed from having eighty nine receptions, seven hundred and seventy two yards, eight point seven per reception. The touchdowns was dropped. Down and that's line. with broken ribs, right, right, Aaron? Uh, for about four or five weeks, yeah. And he's he started to get better as the season went on. Um, I don't care about PFF grades, but he grades out well. His and he did most of his work, obviously, eighty-seven percent of it out of the slot. Um, was one of the best when you break it down to slots. Uh, PFF. I had a tweet earlier that I retweeted from last year when I looked up some of my thoughts on Cole Beasley. Uh, last year in November, again, when the Bills were kind of struggling and people were out on Cole Beasley, this was in the middle of him having this injury. He was number two tied with Tyreek Hill for receptions among slot receivers, and they were only eight behind Cooper Cup, who was having like an unbelievable, phenomenal wide receiver season that we've never seen before. And so I do think 
like I'm hesitant to know what's left out of him because we don't always see guys that retire come back and have success. Like most of the time, you, you don't quite see them at that what they were. But we're not far removed from him being productive in this offense with these guys. Yeah, I think, and to your point about um, guys as they get up there in age and the difficulty with, I mean, it's a long season. It's tough to mm-hmm. get through, a, you know, a full NFL season without injuries. And I think we saw that with Beasley last season. He just Big kept time. getting, in days. you yeah. know, yeah, he just kept getting hurt. And um, even was it the 2020 playoffs too that he was playing hurt? Um, I feel like he and, and Brown were both really banged up as we were, you know, going into the playoffs that year. They but were. Regard- yeah, he was playing on like a uh, fractured leg or something like that uh, at the end of that 2020. But now like the, the chance to get him in and, you know, have a shorter season, I think it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty enticing. Like if his, if his body is right, um, it, it, there's a better chance that he'll make it now through the end of the season um, at, a, at a higher level. You know, and just without... so with all those targets that he had, uh, last year in the receptions, he had five drops on the year with a drop percentage of 5.3, which right now 5.3 is under the NFL average of drops for receivers uh, with so many targets with like 50 targets. Um, and so, so we get a bean or bean or uh, McDermott conference today, by the way, does anyone know? I, I don't know. I, the would short schedule. Gonna, I would assume they're going to speak just from the move, right? We heard, we heard Brandon Bean after John Brown. So I would assume we would get that even if it's just at practice afterwards and not a technical press conference. I think we'll hear from somebody today. But well, I, technically, I, I Tuesday has too. no media. Tuesday has no media. Um, but I didn't. It's I didn't a weird week, though, it. right? Yeah. With the Saturday game, like the schedule might be, a, you know, might be a little off. Yeah, I was asking that in our DM group because it matters to me and how I prep for my show of listening to the press conferences. Like, does that injury report that's normally on Wednesday come out today? And is Sean McDermott's or are they operating in a normal week? I don't believe so. And that's, that's you know, obviously, a, you know, our show's tonight. So same thing for me. I don't believe so that they keep the same time frame on the press. I think it only extends out on Monday night football or Thursday. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't believe there's a, there's a crunch. I, think I mean, at some they, point, they something's going to release gonna have it on to Friday. Shift. You're gonna, they have to internally, whether it's the media or something, something is shifting in their week schedule. Yeah, they're either losing a day of practice or they're losing a day of re- of rest, oh, right? They're, they're losing something. In. Yeah. Yeah, they're losing something. And uh, and Miami has to travel on a Friday, too. Ugh. Well, and to uh, Greg's point in our DM group, there's a pretty massive difference when you're talking about a game of margins in the Bills already being at home after that game on a short week versus the Dolphins having to travel after a night game and getting back to the East Coast, like, we were off to a head start in terms of rest. Even if it's minimal, there's still a head start of being at your facility to get your treatments after the game and then being home to do what you would normally do versus having to take a long flight cross country after a night game. Like there's some substantial and difference. There. Clear snow coming and a, and a road trip where you were just using heaters in 60 degree weather right. in LA right. uh, with a partially covered, st- you know, mostly covered stadium. Um, yeah. In a situation where you've already been bad on the road trip, your offense receivers are banged up, and um, you know Hill and Waddle are both banged up. Your your Jeff Wilson's banged up too. It doesn't look right. Can you come to Buffalo on a short week with weather? I don't I know, hope guys. Not. I don't know. I hope not. Uh, and now the weapon Cole Beasley out of the slot, right? No. Well, here real quick, I was I was supposed to get out of this at ten thirty. Now I have to leave because I got to go pick up my kid. But real quick, Kevin, plug your show because it's tonight, um, and then we'll get out of here. Yeah, for sure. You guys can find me and Mike Bunt here tonight, 7 o'clock live, 7 to 8 live on the Cover One Network. Uh, we'll, we'll be going through the game, the signing, pretty much extension of these spaces um, for some of the topics. And I think Eric's got some a good show following me right up tonight, I believe. Yep. Yep. So yeah, lots, lots right of content to, to, to consume. Uh, to pick this right back up, uh, 7 o'clock, and then uh, Eric will follow with uh, his kind with some great some great guests. For sure. And so, yeah, guys, thanks for everybody that tuned in. Again, thanks for everybody that come in, came, came in to chat with us here uh, about this. And everyone kept it civil, which is super cool because it's a polarizing topic. So appreciate everybody here in the space. Um, Chris, thanks for coming on. Kevin, appreciate you, man. Uh, yeah, good talking with you guys. Yeah, I'm sure we will be spacing out here again soon. And uh, go Bills. Go Bills. Go Bills. Talk to everyone soon.